Hello and welcome. It's Bev from Living Fabulously. And today I'm absolutely honored to introduce my guest, Dr. Deanna Minnick. And Deanna is an internationally recognized functional health expert. She's an author, she's an artist, she's so many beautiful things. So welcome to you, Deanna. Oh, thank you so much, Bev. It's great to be here with you. Brilliant. And let's talk a little bit more about you and what it is that you do, Deanna. Yeah, so currently I, I, I talk about myself as an author and a teacher, and I would also say I'm a student and constant truth seeker. And so I've written six books, and I do lots of teaching. I, I teach a number of online courses and programs for people to be healthy. I teach uh, at the university on a, a number of different topics. I teach for the Institute for Functional Medicine. So I have a master's and a Ph.D., in nutritional biochemistry and research side of nutrition. And in conjunction with that, when I finished my training, I went into doing more clinical work. So I became a certified nutrition specialist. I became a fellow of the American College of Nutrition. I did my functional medicine training. I worked with uh, Jeff Bland, who is the father of functional medicine. I did that with him for 10 years, and I still maintain contact with him, and he's a great friend and mentor. And so My professional credentials, I I guess you would say I'm a nutritionist, but I I would say that I go beyond food. I'm also into mind, body, and lifestyle medicine. Mm, That's brilliant. And I could never have done that intro myself, so thank you for sharing (laughs) that vast. I love how it's a blend of moving from, you know, the aspect, like you say, you could say you're a nutritionist, but it's way more than that, that whole body-mind approach to us because we're, we're complex beings. So that's amazing. And so tell me a little bit about your own well-being journey and how was it that you came to be focused on health? Mm, I never thought I would be focused on nutrition. Uh, so when I was very young, when I was probably eight or nine years old, my mother went through a personal revelation. She was pregnant with my brother. And I think for most moms, what ends up happening is they become more conscious of their decisions when they know that they have another being that they're responsible for. And that happened with her, especially with my brother. And so her revelation was around food and faith. And so my mom became very tuned into her own religious beliefs as well as her own nutritional beliefs. And so my life went topsy-turvy at the age of nine. I was taught how to read labels and food. We couldn't eat from um, any kind of processed food selections. I remember my mom uh, didn't have a microwave. I had to bring my own food to parties and gatherings. And so... He was very strict, and I think that this led to me becoming very, very vigilant and almost defiant about her beliefs because it made me feel different to have to eat different. Mm -hmm. And so I started to sneak foods. I started to eat lots of sugar. I started binging. I started overeating. I, when I was a teenager, I had all kinds of issues. My body started to change hormonally. I was very moody, uh, and I had... Now, looking back, I realized what was going on for me. I had endometriosis, and that was later diagnosed in my 20s. So I had an inflammatory condition of my uterus. I, every month for me was a challenge. It was just lots of pain, doubling over, headaches, sometimes vomiting, and it really impacted my social life. And I, I wasn't able to be involved in sports or, you know, really kind of the the social aspects of being a teen. And so I struggled with that. I struggled with my gut. And because I binged on sugar and really took advantage of certain foods, I had skin issues. And of course, we know that skin and gut are connected, right? But I didn't want to listen to my mom because that just didn't seem to be my answer. So I remember even as a teenager, I would uh, make doctor appointments for myself to go to the dermatologist, to, I was taking all these antibiotics for my skin, for my gut. And then when I got into college, I continued to seek to find how I can make myself feel better. I knew that something was wrong. And because I love science, it led me into reading and reading. You know, at the time, we didn't have the internet. That's how old I am. And so I would go to the <laughs> library and I'd get all these books. I'd get this huge encyclopedia and I'd try to figure myself out, my body. I was obsessed 
with trying to figure out what was wrong. And of course, you know, I, at one point I was uh, wanting to go to medical school because I just felt like that was my path is medicine and trying to, to seek the answers to these, these problems. And it was really coming from a personal place. You know, I started working for doctors and then I had a wake up call. I took my first yoga class when I was 19 and after working for all of these doctors every summer and even throughout my, my college years, I kind of felt like, you know what, this, this path is not for me. There's something bigger here. And maybe my mom was on to something. So I went on to graduate school to study nutrition. And what I found in graduate school was that so many others were trying to figure out their own bodies as well. It's almost like, you know, people that go into psychology, they're trying to figure out their psyche. For me, going into nutrition, I'm trying to figure out how do I heal myself with food? Can I even heal myself? So that's really where my journey led me. And um, I would say that food and nutrition became a huge part of my path to healing and helped me tremendously. But it didn't do everything for me. So even into my 20s, you know, I was eating a certain way. I was vegetarian. I thought I was doing all the right things. There were some obvious things that now I look back and say, oh, my goodness, I didn't realize X, Y, and Z. I didn't realize... I was sensitive to these certain foods. Maybe I shouldn't have been eating gluten or maybe I shouldn't have had so much in the way of carbohydrate and, you know, just certain things for my own body. So I learned a lot along the way. And what happened for me at the, the latter half of my 20s is I got better, but not 100%. And so I continued going to practitioners. I went for chiropractic. I went to naturopaths. I went to energy healers, Reiki. I, I did everything because I was just looking for the stone that I had not turned over. And I think for me, what really helped me tremendously was I started to paint. And I'm not a painter by trade or profession. I felt called to start connecting to a canvas and start painting big, very vivid pictures. And so that's what happened in my journey. I started to connect science with the art of creativity and that's who I am. I, I kind of feel like, you know, my, my scientific mind was there always, but my, my more creative artistic brain wasn't totally turned on at the same level. And so now many decades later, I kind of feel like this is it. This is who I am. I am the person that advocates science and spirituality. I'm the person that advocates the logic and also the art, the creative aspects. And I want to see them come together in people's lives. Mm, that's really important, you know, that whole aspect of integration, left and right brain, because the Western world honors the left brain, doesn't it? And less so the right brain. You know, I'm constantly reminded of that, even though I have been trained in science of how limiting and rigid science can be and how... Almost, you know, science can be so attacking, you know, and, and the thing is science is, even though it tries to be objective, it still remains very subjective. It's still prone to whatever belief systems or container or ways that that researcher sets it up. So science has limitations. And what I would like to see is that science is used to help in understanding the things that are non-physical. And that the non-physical, maybe the spiritual parts, are used to infuse into science. I think that that's a more balanced picture. Mm -hmm. And in your books, Deanna, you use and reference colors a lot. So talk to me about that. Yeah. I. So what happened when I got into painting was something clicked for me. I was tuned into colors. I started seeing people in a very colorful way. I know, would notice what they're wearing. I would meet somebody and say, oh, that person feels so red. It was almost like I was developing a relationship with colors. Like it was my language. I was painting them. I was dressing in certain colors. I would, even uh, my first house, I painted every room a certain color that had a certain meaning for me. So my my living room was evergreen. My um, bedroom was purple. My kitchen was yellow. And I'm not talking like a subtle yellow. I'm talking bright. <laughs> Everything was bright and vivid and, and like pulsing from the walls. And so color is a unifying force. And I think that many people need more of the unifying forces rather than things that 
keep us fragmented and keep us divided from each other. And I can talk with a three-year-old about color as much as I can talk with a 73-year-old about color. You know, color is, it spans gender, it spans race, it spans age. Everybody can connect into it. Even people that are blind and can't see color, I have been told, have a sense or can feel color. You know, color goes beyond even the visual realm. So when I think of colors, um, in, in my book, Whole Detox, I have chapters dedicated to every single color. So I looked at the science on red. What does it mean to see something red? How does it impact our thinking? How does it impact our, our living? And if we are eating red colored foods, how does that change our body? Does, is there anything to be said for red pigments in food? And so I put myself on this whole journey that was very much connected to the experience of color in, in a health perspective, in a health context. And so that's really um, the whole detox work in the Rainbow Diet. My books all started to have this color. And, and I want to show everybody this. This is something that I have in uh, my whole detox book as well as on my website so everybody can download this. This is freely available. I want it to be available because it gives people such great information that each of these seven colors that I work with has a body connection has a life connection, some kind of theme or symbolism in our, in our lives. Like, for example, I'll just walk you through one real quick. The red system is connected to what defines us as a physical body, our immune system, our DNA, our bones, our skin, our, the protein. The protein part of us and the minerals of us give us structure. Otherwise, we'd be jelly and a lot of liquid. So we need structure, right? And that's what the root does. So if we think of that element of structure, not just in body, but in more of the metaphorical sense, that structure could be a sense of safety, a sense of security, a sense of structure within community, having a sense of tribe. And then moving along that continuum, what are the foods? What are the foods that create that sense or those feelings in the body or support those body systems? So that's how I think. This is my operating system, these seven systems of health, which um, initially were based in the chakra system, which comes from the East Indian traditions of the mystical and, and artistic and healing traditions. But I took it further. I took each of these and really fleshed them out to make it a way to really work with your health in a very integrated way. So I know that you took the quiz. Uh, yes. I do have a quiz that people can take to figure out which of those seven colors are imbalanced. And yes. the quiz is quite long, as you probably experienced, because you, you may not have realized this, but I was testing and looking at your body, your, your life, your foods, and um, in general, just your, your symptoms. And so it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive questionnaire. And I've also trained practitioners to assess how these body systems interact when things are overactive or underactive and what to do about it. Yes, and I liked at the end that there was this visual summary and I could see from, you know, just looking at it, thankfully many of mine were in balance. There was one that was a little higher than the other scores and I thought, oh, that's so interesting. I'm going to go and explore that. So thank you for sharing that because not only can you get the quiz, now we've got a, a download that people can look at and we're going to talk more about detoxing now so that we can then talk about the whole detox approach. So that would be really um, great for the listeners too. So Deanna, why do you believe detoxification then is key to our well-being? As long as humans have been in existence, we've always done some kind of cleansing. If we look at the medical tradition, we look at the ancient Greeks and Romans. And the idea was that if we were sick, we were invaded with something that needed to be purged from the body and that purging could happen through herbs it could happen through applying leeches bloodletting sweating there were all kinds of ways that were used in ancient medical practices that really fit the idea that there was something invading the body that needed to be removed similarly in spiritual and in religious traditions what we see is that just about every tradition i've looked at has some method of clearing or cleansing in order to remove oneself a bit from the body to clear it and to focus more on the spirit so i grew up catholic and in the catholic tradition 
There are the, uh, well, there's the 40 days of Lent where you're giving something up for 40 days and really focusing on a particular intention. I've also studied with a Native American woman who uh, really brought to light this idea of a sweat lodge. But a sweat lodge is not just lots of sweating. It's a purification practice, and it's also very spiritual, and there's a lot of intention setting and a lot of ritual around that. So I don't think that detox is anything new, and so many people want to poke holes and say, we don't need to detox. Our body is already doing these things. Well, well, if you look back at history and traditions, we have always needed to cleanse, purify. It's almost like the modern term might be reset, reset our inner world in order to make sense of what's happening on the outside. And sometimes we, we need to get clear. We need yeah. to see what is toxic. And, and what is a toxin? To me, it's any barrier that stands in the way of your growth, in the way of your health. Yeah. It could be a toxic thought. It could be a toxic emotion, you know, something that really keeps you just in that do loop of feeling. And so you constantly feel this fear over and over again, and you can't break the cycle. You know, that could be a toxin. You know, fear is good, but, you know, when it's really permeating our lives and impeding our function, it's not so good. Then we're going to have all kinds of problems. So the way that I define a toxin is very broad compared to maybe in the classic sense of a heavy metal like mercury or arsenic or a plastic in the environment that maybe we're drinking out of plastic water bottles. Mm-hmm. Sure, all of those things are physical toxins, but I do think that we are subject to emotional toxins, yeah. mental toxins, and even I would say a spiritual toxin could be not having a sense of purpose or meaning where we feel very lost and fragmented you know that stands in the way of our potential so true because if you if you limited it to the physical body only you wouldn't be able to consider things like relationship you know sometimes some of our closest relationships are toxic because we have poor boundaries or you know we don't hold um, ourselves accountable for speaking our truth and things like that. So it's, yeah, it's a really important fact that we're looking beyond just purely food in this instance. So that's really great. So what are some of the key success, success factors to de- doing a good detox then? Because you're talking about seven mm-hmm. systems of health. We're talking about, you know, beyond the physical body. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. So, and I've done detox programs so many times with people one-on-one and also in large groups. And so I have a good sense of what the success factors are. There are three things that I think are important. First and foremost, you've got to prepare your space. Whatever your living space is like, whether you're in a small studio apartment or a large home or maybe something more temporary, one room, you've got to prepare your space because The space is you. The space really represents what is going on in your mind and can influence a lot of what is in your mind. So you've got to look at clutter. Uh, I think that that's essential. And some people get very overwhelmed by this. They think, there's no way I could clear my whole house. And I say, okay, that's, that's fine. I want you to pick a room. And even if one room feels overwhelming, I remember one detox that I did, I just focused on my medicine cabinet with all my lotions and potions and creams. And, and I felt like, you know what? I have not cleaned this stuff up in forever. <laughs> I am just going to clean this and make this my universe. So you have to pick. You have to say, okay, I'm going to clear this. you got to go with, you know how sometimes maybe I'm a little bit more um, in tune or just uh, picky about my surroundings, but usually there's something that's bugging me, whether it's my spice rack or there's something in the kitchen or the bedroom, I need to arrange something. You got to pay attention to your intuition. What feels out of alignment? So that's the first one. You got to find something in your space. Maybe it's your sock drawer. You got to clean up your socks. Maybe you have too many socks or missing socks and it's just... (laughs) That's going to, believe it or not, it all adds to the bigger picture, right? Our space is us. Second, you have to prepare your mind. If people are not committed to a detox and they say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do it, but they're not really in it, you're only going to get what you put into it. And so 
we need to really focus our mind on, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do it as best we can. We're going to set the expectation to uh, as much as we can do, be hopeful, not aim for perfectionism, but aim for what's realistic and, and what are some small things we can do with impact. So I think that that's really important is to set your mind straight. And usually the way that I do that with everybody is I say, set your intention. And I want you to write it down. I want you to write it down on a little post-it note. And I want you to have that visible while we go through the detox. Maybe it's on your computer. Maybe it's by your bathroom mirror. Maybe it's on your, the, the dashboard of your car. I want you to write down your intention because that sets your mental framework. And then the last one, the third factor of success is make sure that you let your community know that you need their support while you're going through this. So oftentimes, I think that so many people have great intentions. They're set in their mind. They're set in their home. But what they don't have is they don't have a set community that says, go for it. I'm supporting you. I'm here all the way. I've got your back. In fact, they feel a lot of resistance. They get a lot of, hmm, here she goes again. And so they don't feel support from the tribe. So you have to find some people. You've got to find buddies. You've got to find people that are going to support you no matter what. Maybe it's one friend. Maybe it's a practitioner. Maybe it's a coach. Maybe it's somebody you have to um, pay as you're going through a process, you know, where, you know, you, you are accountable to them and they're helping you along. I, you know, um, I have the, the, the old quote, which is, a prophet is never recognized in his or home his or her homeland. It's mm -hmm. almost like when you do something within your family, it's looked at with a very skeptical eye. And often you won't find support within your own family or friends. You have to even maybe sometimes move outside of that. Sometimes you will. Sometimes you will. I know in my family, it's kind of a mixed group. My mom is really still into health. My dad, not so much. He's kind of a junk food guy. So I know how much I can say to each of them and how much support I think I can be getting. So those are the three things. Before you do a detox, set your space, set your mind, and set your community. And until you got all those things in motion, you know, it's almost like – you know, that, that lays the foundation for you to kind of move into the program then and start to be looking at the food and the lifestyle. Yeah, and I guess w what I'm hearing there is, because this is what a lot of people say, for example, recently I've been talking about, is gluten for you? And a lot of people say that in their homes, they do really well. And so your point there about enlisting mm -hmm. your community support yep. is absolutely vital to success. Mm -hmm. And if you know you're not going to get it, then seek the right support, like you say, from a coach or somebody else like that. Because mm -hmm. the, the first two are up to you entirely, aren't they? You know. Mm -hmm. And when I teach about getting quality sleep, one of the things is I say, make your bedroom a haven. Because if it's cluttered and it's all you know messy and there's washing and things like that, you're not going to sleep very well because energetically it's just messy really. <laughs> so. I agree with you. In fact, you know, I mean, the age old practice of feng shui of really looking at one space. I mean, I even think of Carl Jung's work talking about dream work. When we dream about our house, our space, we're dreaming about us. You know, the, the house, the home, our space is so metaphorical. And so I do think it's a big deal. My husband is, is not as particular about that kind of stuff like I am, but I feel it like yes. I can feel if something is not right or if I have to change something up. Sometimes it's not about getting rid of stuff. It's about organizing things and how do we organize so that we feel more refreshed by our space. Maybe we move a painting on a wall or we add a light to a room that didn't have light in a corner. Sometimes I'll take um, essential oils and just aromatize a room and have a completely different experience in that room. It's almost like, whew, I just you know, clear that space. And so mm. perhaps that comes from my training too with my Native American teacher who taught us a lot about rituals with the space, clearing the space, you know, just even doing simple things like clapping, mm. clapping and just breaking up. Um, you know, there are things we can see and things we can't see. And so it's just nice to set the groundwork with a nice clear space that we feel really good in. Mm. And for some people, it might be more involved. Like I can remember somebody who... I tell this story all the time, but it was such a pro profound experience with her. So she had a white kitchen 
you know, white walls, white cabinets, and she didn't like to cook. And I said, well, what's your favorite color? And she said, sage green, kind of like this, this sweater I'm wearing. And I said, how would you feel if you were in a kitchen that was sage green? So she, in three weeks, she came back to see me and she had painted her kitchen sage green. And she felt like a completely different person in her space. Yeah. So that color we see on the walls that we are constantly programming our mind with, it's changing our emotions, our feelings, our choices. And, you know, I'm not the only one saying this. There, there are, is some good research on what heals people, optimal healing environments. Having a window in a hospital room or having certain colors of walls leads to better healing of people versus other things. And so I, I do think it's important to look at our space. Mm. And maybe you're right. That's something we can all do and we can have control over to some extent. And even if we don't have control over the whole house, I'm sure that there's one corner that we can really feel like we have the locus of control over. Yes. And I think that gives us confidence and um, comfort too, you know, when it's, it's uh, because like, like you were talking about energetically for me, when I walk into a very cluttered space, I find it quite draining. So that's why in my space, I like to keep things in the place that they belong, not fetishly, but, you know, uh, I like to put things back where they belong because then, I, first of all, I'll know where to find them. But secondly, yeah. I just find that that organization gives me that comfort. So um, that's really great. <laughs> You know, another method of organization, I just want to mention this because it's so common these days that people are on their computers. And sometimes uh, if I'm around other people on their computer and I see how they have all these screens open, they have all these uh, icons on their desktop. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that, I couldn't handle that. Like I, I don't, I like to have like one or two screens open, make it very streamlined because I feel like otherwise we're, we're digesting, we're trying to take in all this information. So it's not just on the outside in a room, it's anything that we're seeing and, and interacting with is um, really essential to look at, I think. Mm -hmm. And Deanna, let's talk more about your whole detox book. So tell us the approach you've taken in that book and how mm -hmm. it works. Yeah, the first couple of chapters are all going into the colors, the science of the colors and the science of detox what things are toxic and what can you do to remove that toxic barrier. Then there's a questionnaire to help you figure out, okay, out of these seven areas, kind of like you, you took the quiz, where do I stack up? And, and people can always do that quiz. They're, they're going to get different results potentially. Some people that do my whole detox program, they continue to have issues in the same system. Usually it's the yellow one or it's the red one. And if not, then sometimes they move and they have issues in other systems. And then from there, they move to the 21-day program. So in Chapter 10, I talk about the foods to take out, the foods to include. And then I go through 21 days. And every day of the 21 days is color-coded. So the first three days, we focus on the color red. Days four through six, we focus on orange. Days seven through nine, we focus on yellow. And we go from there throughout the whole rainbow. And so what that means is that during those days of the program, I have recipes that incorporate red colored foods or the foods that are good for the immune system on those particular days. I do think that it's not just eating a rainbow, but it's getting variety within the individual colors that's important because that ensures different nutrients. If we're always just eat, having tomatoes as our source of red, we're just getting what the tomato provides. We don't have the raspberry or the radish or the cherry or the apple. And each of them are so different in their composition. In fact, I was just looking at a study using sour cherries versus apples. And what the researchers showed was that the sour cherries were much better for helping with certain markers than the apple. The apples didn't do anything for this particular marker of antioxidant status, but the cherries did. So it's kind of like nature is so connected and offers us so much. So why just have one thing all the time? I think it's important to shake it up. And so within the program, I have this kind of, the, the recipes are diverse. I have a track for vegans. I have a track for omnivores. So for the plant-based people, everything is all plants. For the meat-eating people, there is meat and plants. Because I do believe that everybody is different, and we have personalized nutrient needs, and I respect that.
And I do think you can detox appropriately on both tracks. There are shopping lists. And one thing I'm, I'm leaving out that is really essential is that for every day, there are actually seven different things to do. And you can pick and choose. Some people are very ambitious and they want to do them all. And then other people say, I'm just going to do the food and I'm done. Okay, that's fine. And that's impactful. But if you decide to go further, there's an emotion for the day, an emotion log. Then there's a journaling of a thought pattern that you may have that connects to the theme of the day. Then there's a short, quick, physical activity, some kind of movement to, to bring into the day. Then there are affirmations, things that we say, just a quick affirmation for the day. Then I have a written out visualization so that people can visualize what they, they really want to um, manifest for that day. And then a short meditation. And some people look at that and say, oh my gosh, Deanna, you have seven things. And I say, you know what? I've added up from the emotions to the meditation and it only takes 30 extra minutes per day. So if you choose to do them all, it's only going to cost you half an hour. But if you choose just to do, let's just say you say, okay, I'm only going to do the affirmation. Well, that's quick. If you only want to do the emotions, that's quick. Um, so many of these by themselves can be very quick, effective ways, different mind-body techniques to help with one's life. And I do believe that how you eat is how you live, and how you live is how you eat. So if you change your life, you're going to change how you eat. If you change how you eat, you're going to change how you live. They Beautiful. are connected. And so you get to choose. You get to choose what you want from this buffet over the course of the 21 days. And on every day, you can do something a little bit different if you'd like. Mm. And I like the idea that you're creating the space for yourself over 21 days. So why wouldn't you invest another 30 minutes in yourself? And um, I love that whole concept of, resetting because you you've choice now you've got somebody's guidance your wisdom you've brought your wisdom together to share and it gives somebody a little roadmap to follow for 21 days and then work out what they want to persist with you know post that because some of those practices may be new to them or some of them they've perhaps forgotten along the way so i love the idea of taking a journey over 21 days and some of those will become new habits, which will be really enriching for their whole life. So that's brilliant. It's really true. Uh, you get to select. In fact, I just saw a study today that showed that when people have choice and they have variety, they actually will have an increased liking for vegetables, which I thought was kind of an interesting study. So what it told me was that there's power in choice and there's power in variety. And those are two things that I bring into the whole detox program. It empowers people to know that they can make the selection and then they feel accountable for their selection because it's them who chose it. Yes. It wasn't somebody else who told them to do it. It was them. So I, I think that um, based on what I've seen with the program, it's been very effective for people. They end up living more colorful lives. I never intend that people lose weight, but some people do. You know, there's just that shuffling of their, their bodies that where they lose, you know, sometimes paying attention to emotions can help us with bodily things. And for some people, it's about their emotional health as they go through the program. Mm. So it's, it's fun. It's a, a great experience to, to immerse oneself in. And like you said, it's only 21 days. It takes 21 days to form a habit and, and really get connected into something. Uh, and it takes seven days to get something back. So it's almost like it takes more work to overcome these habits that we've created over the years. So at least the 21 days is what I say. And then when you're done, I have a way to create whole detox for life. You know, what is one thing that you want to take going forward? And to do that, you know, it doesn't have to be huge. It can be something really small, but yet impactful. Yes, because I think with the pace that we live at, if we never stop and take stock, and actually take time for just ourselves to nurture and nourish ourselves deeply, really, it's really a difficult space to be in if we're constantly just doing things instead of being in that space where it's just for us creating health and well-being. 
It's true. You know, many people have a lot of guilt around spending time on themselves. And that's also something we talk about in the program. You know, a lot of working mothers who feel like, I can't have all that alone time. I've got kids. I've got work. I'm so busy. I've got to make dinner. So there are ways to do this that are small yet meaningful. And for the people who want to give it their all, there are ways to do that too. It's everywhere uh, we can be along that continuum. It's, there's no right or wrong. There's just a personalized path. And so we have to get out there and, and make those steps at some point, just mm -hmm. one step forward, one step at a time. Yes, I agree with that. One step at a time. And the consistency is what matters too. You know, so if you choose yeah. to do one thing and you do it consistently, you're going to get results, whatever that thing is that you choose to do. Yeah, you know, I talk about the snail and the grasshopper. Some of us have a grasshopper moment where we have a huge jump and all of a sudden we have a leap into, you know, wow, we, we're going to go off of sugar and we feel good about it and it works. We can have moments like that, but they're far and fewer compared to the snail. The snail is about moving very gradually, patiently. I have a hard time with patience and many other people do too, I notice. <laughs> so you move patiently and solidly and consistently with one thing. And the thing we know about the body is that because it is interconnected, even that one small snail-like thing creates a ripple effect through our being. So even if we say, oh my gosh, that I'm just eating more red-colored foods, how is that important? Well, those red-colored foods are changing your psychology, they're changing your body, uh, less inflammation, better insulin, better stress response, all of those things can be happening. And so there's a lot more that's going on there. And we can also change our mood. What I have seen is that when people eat more colorful foods, they start having more colorful moods. And so you start feeling better. You know, within that first seven to 10 days of this program, people, you know, that, that's like when it starts to click. It's like they're over there, they're binging their addictions, their, um, you know, their, their coffee hangovers, all of those things. And now it's like they have this clarity and they really feel good. They feel energized. They're sleeping better. Uh, you know, just, I think energy is a big thing. Many people are very fatigued and they don't take time to feel fatigued. They just cover it up with sugar, coffee, and alcohol. And so when they, have something like this where they pull away to remove the illusion and the veil of a lot of those things, they get clarity. And as part of that clarity, honoring their body, being able to know that if they're tired, to have strategies in place to honor your body being tired rather than just masking it, which is only going to make it worse. So it's, um, you know, a, a small amount of prevention for a lot of, in the long run, uh, you know, just preventing us from moving in the direction of a chronic disease. Mm. Or if we have something more chronic, can really help to undo some of the things that have been created in the body. So I think that that's important. I've seen that over and over with people. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree with the approach you're taking there. And I'd love to find out more. And we've been talking about it. But I want to just close with what are your tips for living fabulously, Deanna? So first and foremost, as you would probably anticipate me saying this, uh, focus on color. You know, I think that so many people are up in the mind and not down in the heart. And so really come from an artistic, creative viewpoint of your life. What are you creating? You're creating with your body. You're creating with your thoughts. You're creating with your emotions. You're creating with your clothing. You're creating with your space. So question number one, one huge tip for living fabulously is Get connected to your sense of creativity. I want every practitioner out there asking you, how are you being creative? And I want you to ask yourself, how am I being creative today? You know, what does that mean for me in my life? Secondly, as part of that, I want you to eat the rainbow. I want you to eat the rainbow foods. And then within each color, I want you to have variety. The science of variety and diversity of foods is there. It's compelling. It helps us. It's helping us with our mood, with our immune system, Overall, we're, we're just going to have a broader palette of different nutrients. So I think that's essential. And then number three, I would say find your tribe. Find a colorful tribe that cares about you, that connects to you, 
and support you um, 100%. And, and, you know, you feel like you can really be yourself. I do think that our sense of community determines so much about our sense of well-being. So those three things, I, I say, you know, focus on color, focus on creativity, focus on eating a rainbow and, and find your tribe. Those, those are absolutely fabulous. Thank you, Deanna. And you can find um, Dr. Deanna Minnick at her website. She's got one purely around the whole detox. It's www.whole-detox.com and also at www.deannaminnick.com. They will be in the show notes, so you'll be able to find those. And she's also on Facebook, so you can follow her there mm -hmm. uh, with Deanna.Minnick. So, um, Thank you so much for being with me today. I feel so inspired to actually rethink even the color of, because I I think I'm pretty good on my food, but now I'm thinking, hmm, what red thing did I eat last? You know, so it's, it's good that you prompted me to even think about that. And thank you so much for sharing well, the beautiful wisdom too. Well, and what I'm observing about you right now, looking at your surroundings is you've got a lot of blue. Your glasses are blue. You're wearing blue. You've got um, pillows and tables uh, in your surroundings that are blue. It's like this very distinct blue, the color of truth. And so what complements that blue? You know, having some of the warming colors too, the red, the orange, and the yellow um, can help with that. So anyway, yeah, I mean, it's all right there. We can just look at our space, and it's us and what's going on for us. So, yeah. Yeah, and my, my other favorite color is the bright watermelon, you know, the sort of orangey, oh, orangey yeah. red color. Oh, so beautiful, that's, yeah. That's another, another color <laughs> <laughs> in my space. So, yeah, that's I great. find I live near the beach, so um, these colors oh. are pretty calming and, and gentle in, in the space. So, yes, all my, but when I, um, for myself, I love bright colors. So, I've just sort of, you've given me permission, Deanna. <laughs> Be bold and bright with my colors. So thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much, Bev. It's been a delight.